Matthew 11:12 The kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. How do I mortify the flesh? Well the flesh is a bosom traitor. It's like the Trojan horse within the walls which does all the mischief. The flesh is a sly enemy. It kills by embracing. The embraces of the flesh are like the ivy embracing the oak, which sucks out the strength of it for its own leaves and berries. And so the flesh, by its soft embraces, sucks out of the heart all that is good. The pampering of the flesh is the quenching of God's spirit. The flesh chokes and stifles holy motions. The flesh sides with Satan. There is a party within us which will not pray, which will not believe. The flesh inclines us more to believe a temptation than a promise. The flesh is so near to us, its counsels are more attractive. And there's no chain of adamant which binds so tightly as the chain of lust. In the best of saints, do what they can. Sin will fasten its roots in them and spring out sometimes with inordinate desires. There's always something which needs mortifying. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires and greed, which is idolatry. Colossians 3.5 how do I mortify the flesh? Number one, withdraw the fuel that may make lust burn. Avoid all temptations. Take heed of that which nourishes sin. Those who pray that they may not be led into temptation must not lead themselves into temptation. Number two, fight against fleshly lust with spiritual weapons, faith, and prayer. The best way to combat with sin is upon our knees. Beg strength from Christ. Samson's strength lay in his hair. Our strength lies in our head, Christ. This is a mystery to the major part of the world who gratify the flesh rather than mortify it. He wounded the old serpent three times. What an infinite mercy it is that God has blessed us with scriptures. The barbarous Indians have their golden mines, but not the scriptures, which are more to be desired than much fine gold. Our Savior bids us search the scriptures. We must not read these holy lines carelessly as if they did not concern us, or, or run over them hastily, but peruse them with reverence and seriousness. The noble Bereans searched the scriptures daily. The scripture is the treasury of divine knowledge. It is the rule and touchstone of truth. Out of this well we draw the water of life. Read the word as a book made by God himself, other books may be written by holy men, but this book is inspired by the Holy Spirit. It's the library of the Holy Spirit. Read the word as the perfect rule of faith. It contains all things essential to salvation. The word teaches us how to please God and how to order our lives in the world. It instructs us in all things that belong either to prudence or piety and is able to make us wise unto salvation. When you read the word, look on it as a soul-enriching treasury. Search it as for hidden treasure. In this word are scattered many divine sayings. Gather them up as so many jewels. This blessed book will enrich you it fills your head with divine knowledge and your heart with divine grace. In this field, the pearl of price is hidden. What are all the world's riches compared to these? 
islands of spices, coasts of pearl, rocks of diamonds. These are but the riches which reprobates may have. But the word gives us those riches which angels have. Look upon the word as a spiritual armory out of which you fetch all your weapons to fight against sin and Satan. Here are weapons to fight against sin. The word of God is a holy sword which cuts asunder the lusts of the heart. When pride begins to lift up itself, the sword of the Spirit destroys this sin. When passion vents itself, the word of God, like Hercules' club, beats down this angry fury. And when lust boils, the word of God cools that intemperate passion. Here are weapons to fight against Satan. When the devil tempted Christ, he wounded the old serpent three times. With the sword of the Spirit, it is written, Satan soon foils the Christian when he is unarmed and without scripture weapons. Look upon the word as a spiritual looking glass to dress yourselves by. It's a mirror for the blind. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. In other mirrors you may see your face. In this mirror you may see your heart. The mirror of the word clearly represents Christ. He is most precious, altogether lovely, a wonder of beauty, a paradise of delight. Look upon the word as a shop of spiritual antidotes and remedies. If you find yourself dead in duty, here's a medicine. If you find your heart hard, the word will soften and mollify it. If you're poisoned with sin, here's an herb to expel it. Look upon the word as a sovereign elixir to comfort you in distress. It comforts you against all your sins, temptations, and afflictions. What are the promises but divine cordials to revive fainting souls? It makes men so filthy. It is a part of our Christian profession to fight under Christ's banner against the world. The world is a flattering enemy. It shows its golden apple. It's given to some as a snare. Take heed of being drowned in the world's luscious delights. It must be a strong brain that can bear heady wine. He had need have a great deal of wisdom and grace who knows how to maintain a great estate. Riches <coughs> often send up intoxicating fumes which make men's head giddy with pride. It's hard to climb up the hill of God with too many golden weights. The world shows its two breasts of pleasure and profit and many fall asleep with that breast in their mouth. The world never kisses us except with an intention to betray us. The world is a silken halter. The world is no friend to grace. It chokes our love for heavenly things. The earth puts out the fire. Naturally we love the world. Too many are wedded to their money. They live together as man and wife. Oh, let us take heed of being entangled in this pleasing snare Many who have escaped the rock of scandalous sins yet have sunk in the world's golden quicksands. The sin is not in using the world, but in loving it. <coughs> Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 1 John 2.15 Believers are called out of the world. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. John 17, 16. They are in the world, but not of it. A true saint is crucified in his afflictions to the world. Galatians 6, 14. He's dead to the honors and pleasures of it. What delight does a dead man take in pictures or music? Jesus Christ gave himself to redeem us from this present evil world. Galatians 1.4. Living fish swim against the stream. We must swim against the world, else we shall be carried down the stream. 
and fall into the dead sea of hell. The world is deceitful. Our Savior calls it the deceitfulness of riches. Matthew 13, 22. The world promises happiness, but gives weariness. It promises us Rachel, but gives us bleary-eyed Leah. The world promises to satisfy our desires, but only increases them. The world gives poisoned pills, but wraps them in sugar. The world is polluting. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. It's called filthy lucre because it makes men so filthy. Men will damn themselves to get the world. Ahab would have had Naboth's vineyard, though he swam to it in blood. The world is perishing. The world and its desires pass away. The world is like a flower which withers while we are smelling it. One of you is a devil. <clears throat> Examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Self-examination is a necessary but difficult work. Self-examination is the setting up of a court in conscience and keeping a register there that by strict scrutiny a man may know how things stand between God and his own soul. By a serious scrutiny of our hearts we come to know to what prince we belong, whether to the prince of peace or the prince of darkness. Self-searching is a heart anatomy. As a surgeon, when he makes a dissection in the body, he discovers the inward parts, the heart, the liver, the arteries. Just so, a Christian anatomizes himself. Sentimentality and public opinion are false rules to go by. We must judge the state of souls by the light of Scripture. Many have foolish, presumptuous hopes. They fancy their state to be good. And while they weigh themselves in the balance of presumption, they pass the test. Many take their salvation on trust. The foolish virgins thought they had oil in their lamps, the same as the wise. How confident are, are some of salvation, yet never examine their title to heaven Many rest in the good opinions of others. How vain is this? Alas, one may be gold and pearl in the eyes of others, yet God may judge him to be reprobate silver. Others may think him a saint, and God may write him down in his black book. Judas was looked upon by the rest of the apostles as a true believer, yet he was a traitor. And then Jesus replied, Have I not chosen you, the twelve, yet one of you, is a devil, John 6, 70. Others can but see the outward behavior, but they cannot tell what evil is in the heart. Fair streams may run on the top of a river, but vermin may lay at the bottom. We must either leap over them or tread upon them. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Matthew 10:36 to 38. Take heed of the snare in your family. It's one of the devil's great subtleties to hinder us from piety, by our nearest relations, and to shoot us with our own rib. He tempted Adam by his wife. Who would have suspected the devil there? He tempted Job by his wife. Are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die, Job 2.9. Thus would the devil have cooled Job's love for God, but the shield of his faith quenched this fiery dart. Take heed of such tempters. 
It's better to go to heaven with their hatred than to hell with their love. If our dearest friends and family lie in our way to heaven, we must either leap over them or tread upon them. The rat gets into his belly and eats his entrails. Take heed of a slothful, lazy disposition. A slothful person would gladly have heaven, but is loath to take it by storm. Sloth is the soul's sleep. Many, instead of working out salvation, sleep away salvation. Such as will not labor must be put at last to beg. They must beg as divies in hell for one drop of water. God never made heaven as a hive for drones. Sloth is a disease apt to grow upon men. Shake it off. A sluggish ship is a prey to the pirate. A sluggish soul is a prey to Satan. When the crocodile sleeps with his mouth open, the rat gets into his belly and eats his entrails. Just so, while men are asleep in sloth, the devil enters and devours them. Our sleeping time is Satan's tempting time. It's a pitiful thing to be contented with feeble grace. Weak grace may live in the heart, but is sickly, does not flourish into lively acts. Weak grace will not withstand strong temptations or carry us through great sufferings. Little grace will not do God much service. A tree which has but little sap, it will not have much fruit. It may be said that some Christians are stunted in grace. Oh, labor to grow to further degrees of sanctity. The more grace, the more strength. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Second Peter 3.18 If you live after the flesh, if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you, through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. Romans 8.13 Take heed of the flesh as a good consult with the devil as with the flesh. The flesh is a bosom traitor, an enemy within the walls. It's the it's the worst enemy. The flesh cries out, hey, there's a lion in the way. And the flesh says, as Judas, why all this waste? Why all this praying and wrestling? Why do you waste your strength? Why all this waste? The flesh cries out for ease. It is loath to put its neck under Christ's yoke. The flesh is for pleasure. It would rather be playing games than running the heavenly race. Here's a description of fleshly pleasures. You lie on beds inlaid with ivory and lounge on your couches. You dine on choice lambs and fattened calves. You strum away on your harps like David and improvise on musical instruments. You drink wine by the bullful and use the finest lotions. Amos 6, 4-6. These are the delights of the flesh. There was one who tried to please all of his five senses at once. He had a room richly decorated with beautiful pictures. He had the most delectable music. He had all the choice aromatics and perfumes. He had all the sumptuous candies of the confectioner. He was lodged in bed with a beautiful paramour. Thus he indulged the flesh and swore that he would spend all of his estate to live one week like this though he were sure to be damned in hell the next day. Oh, there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. In hell, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. And so he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. Luke 16, 19, 23 and 24. They save one sin and lose one soul. 
take heed of indulging any lust. Indulging in sin will spoil all efforts for heaven. Sin enfeebles. It's like the cutting of Samson's hair. Then the strength departs. Sin is the soul's sickness. Sickness takes a man off his legs and so dispirits him that he's unfit for any holy exercise. A sick man cannot run a race. Therefore, lay the axe to the root. Let sin be hewn down. Do not only abstain from sin in the act, but let the love of sin be mortified. Let every sin be put to the sword. Many will leave all their sins but one. They save one sin. And they lose one soul. One sin is a fetter. A man may lose the race as well by having one fetter on his leg, just as if he had many. I have read of a great monarch who, fleeing from his enemy, threw away the crown of gold on his head, that he might run the faster. And so that sin which you wore as a crown of gold, throw it away, that you may run the faster to the heavenly kingdom. Take heed of too much pursuit after the world. The world cools holy affections. The earth puts out the fire. The world hindered the young man from following Christ. He went away sorrowful. Whereupon, says our Savior, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Luke 18:24. Demas's piety was buried in the earth. Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. 2 Timothy 4:10. The world so blinds men's eyes that they do not see the narrow way to heaven. It so fetters their feet that they do not run in the way of God's commandments. Mithridates, the, the king of Pontus, being beaten by the Romans and fearing he would not escape them, he caused a great deal of silver and gold to be scattered in the way, which, while the Roman soldiers were busy gathering, he got away from them. Satan uses a similar strategy. Knowing what tempting thing riches are, he throws them as baits in men's way, that while they're eagerly gathering these, he may hinder them in their pursuit of eternal happiness. It would hinder a man to climb up a steep rock with heavy weights tied to his legs. Men's golden weights hinder them in climbing up this steep rock which leads to salvation. A man cannot seek both heaven and earth at the same time. He cannot love both Christ and the world, 1 John 2.15. He who is all on fire for the world will be all ice for heaven. Take heed of engaging your affections too far in these earthly things. Use the world as your servant, but do not follow it as your master. Though the sinner shall drink a sea of wrath, yet he shall not drink one drop of injustice.